and a warm welcome to all of you joining us today. Um, achieving change is difficult for many uh, and for many organisations and our TM TV series along with leading panellists has been a great support to many of you this year and we continue to table those discussions to help you and the industry we serve in very focused 60 minute sessions. Our Achieving Change Think Tomorrow Act Today approach is popular, well followed and also with previous sessions, we'll bring you a combined top five towards the end of the session as a key takeaway for you. In this latest TMTV panel debate, we'll look closely at and discuss the best ways to improve staff retention and property roles. Our thought leaders and panellists today will be sharing their own top five with you individually, and many of the strategies that you'll be given will apply to all employees and not just those in property. We expect elements of the technology to be appearing in today's discussion, as well as how we show greater empathy and humanise our approach to workforce management. The rules of engagement, as we are all aware, have shifted and tested us throughout that pandemic. And as we return to life beyond the pandemic, we should look to invest in the right tools to help retain our staff across the industry, and most importantly, keep hold of our talent. This is such a topical subject for the present time, but also in the longer term, as we reshape our cultures to adapt to a new world of work. Many of today's organisations um, and suggestions that you'll hear today will be primary for businesses to add to their own people strategies. And some, but not all, will be already on HR, line managers and leaders' agendas. And if they're not, please take them away, consider them and implement them into your own businesses. I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to today's panellists. Um, we're extremely grateful for all of them investing the time to share their top five with you. And uh, a huge thank you in advance to all of you and Alec that are joining us today. So just to kick us off today, we have uh, Natalie Moore. Uh, Natalie is the founder and managing director of A Conveyancing, a business she started in 2017, having worked in residential conveyancing for almost 20 years. A Conveyancing recently was highly commended at the British Conveyancing Awards for Conveyancing Firm of the Year in the national category. A uh, very good morning to you, Natalie. Hi, Dan. Uh, next in line, we've got Charlotte Jeffrey Campbell. Uh, Charlotte is an experienced property professional, having occupied senior roles in estate agency, lettings, property management, land, new homes, as well as working as a regional sales manager for FIBA. Charlotte is a qualified assessor and IQA for property qualifications and is a nationally respected trainer for the last 10 years. Charlotte is also the founder and director of the Able Agents, which launched in 2020 and carries out on presentations. Very good morning to you, Charlotte. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, next, we've got Glynis Frew. Uh, Glynis is Group Training and Development Director for the Property Franchise Group. Glynis, as many of us will know, brings a huge amount of experience to the industry, having joined Hunters in 1999 in HR, and then went on to become the Hunters CEO in 2015. Glynis has held many senior roles in her career, uh, including firms such as United Biscuits and PepsiCo, as well as running her own successful training company in FMCG. A very good morning to you, Glynis. Good morning. Nice to be here. We've got Rebecca Kirby. Uh, Rebecca is a partner at Flutansky and brings 25 years worth of industry experience. Rebecca brings a wealth of expertise and multi-site management to the discussion today with Flutansky having eight office locations. Her roles oversee many very types of staff that manage all types of residential property transactions, including plot sales, private client residential, B2B conveyancing, Islamic finance transactions, and volume new homes team. Very good morning to you, Rebecca. Morning. Hi, everyone. And finally, we've got Claire Smith. Uh, Claire's the People and Culture Director at the Mortgage Advice Bureau. Claire started life as a lawyer and spent many years in the legal sector. And Claire has been in the property industry two years. Uh, but prior to that was the Culture Ambassador for Money Penny, uh, a company that many of you know. Claire is also using her experience at MAB in her new role and specialises in bringing out the best in people, making companies better in their culture and for engagement strategies. A very good morning to you, Claire. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. Um, okay, well that's our panellists. Um, Natalie, we are going to start with you first on today's panel and um, I will keep us to time. Um, what is your top five and perhaps you can share some of the impacts your top five has had in your own business. So I'll hand over to you to give us a Thank you. Thanks Dan and it's great to be here. Um, so to share my top five, I decided to start with um, a review that we undertook not so long ago, probably about 12 months ago at A Conveyancing. 
um, was to review our HR processes. So we created sort of a centralized library of information and documents that staff had access in their own time. Um, and it was via an app. So we were able to incorporate all our staff related documents, whether it be contract of employment or um, appraisals, performance reviews um, into an app that they could access, which also allowed them to um, view their holiday entitlement, upcoming leave when other members of colleagues were um, off if they wanted to view it at weekends, um, length of service milestones, it also tracked. Um, their birthdays. Um, so it's really creating that culture. Um, their personal documents were available. And it was also an onboarding tool. So they'd, um, at the start of their journey with the firm, they get access to this information. They'd onboard through it. We could make sure as an employer, we were following correct processes in terms of right to work and things like that. And then ongoing announcements, newsletters. So it really sort of joins them into the firm and they can see all their colleagues, a library of who works at the firm and what office and things like that. So they, from the very beginning, they feel part of something which we felt was really, really important. My next top tip is to um, offer progression opportunities. Um, as a graduate coming out with a law degree, career progression has always been important to me, and I know it is with a lot of people working in the legal environment. There's so many different levels um, that people can work within in this sector. Um, I've been fortunate to work through, I think, pretty much every element um, of a conveyancing firm, which gives me a really good understanding. So I can recognise those goals that people um, want to achieve and I can help support and develop them. So as an employer, you know, create training opportunities and, you know, provide mentor advice for people that are joining the profession. Obviously, it's a profession in very short supply at the moment. So we really need to retain our staff and make them feel appreciated. Um, again, invest in studying, um, introduce more people to the industry and diversity as well. And I think by doing that as well, it, it um, results in internal progression and staff feel self-worth. So that was my top tip too. Um, my next top tip is to recognize individual strengths and weaknesses, really get to know employees. It's a two-way relationship. Um, so understand maybe some of their personal circumstances, where people may have weaknesses, um, make sure they don't see them as a failure, identifying any training needs, and then where, you know, you recognise strengths within people, use those strengths to, you know, allow them to empower other people, buddy people that we found at A Conveyancing works really, really well, especially with new people um, or people that might be struggling with confidences of joining a new firm or entering a new position within the firm and then recognize that by way of performance reviews so uh, regular goal settings give constructive um, advice and just keep it positive um, within within the working environment my next top tip is to reward hard work conveyancing is a really really tough industry and over the last two years we've really really felt um how hard it is to work in such a busy, stressed or pressurised industry. So it's really important that people are made to feel appreciated. It's not always about financial awards and pay and things like that. Obviously, if people are looking for that, they will jump ship regardless of whatever. So it's keeping that environment and culture positive and more than just a pay check at the end of the month, whether it's bonus schemes or incentives um, we've, we've tried to combine various things. We've put people up for awards. We have a spin the wheel each month, just as a bit of fun where people can win some prizes. But really, you know, appreciate what how hard people work um, and acknowledge the busy periods when we went through the stamp duty um, deadlines that kept getting pushing back. You know, have milestones where they, they get something back and they're recognised. So again, going back to that two-way relationship, if you, you know, give to them, you'll get a lot more back at the same time. Um, so really creating that culture. And then finally, um, my last top tip is just, again, to create that working environment, make them feel part of the 
business um, flexible working is massive at the moment I think we're at a stage now where the nine to five model isn't for everybody there's a lot of options on the table people are weighing up what's best for them both personally and professionally and um, at Aiken Bay and Sim we are currently trialing the four-day working week because we really want um, people to be in the office so that we've got that collaboration and things like that we we run the four-day working week where people can opt in or opt out and it runs alongside everybody's right to reflect request flexible working which is obviously a legal right so you know be flexible with yourself where they need to work from home or they've got childcare commitments or school runs or that business find a model that works for your business and for your staff um, so hopefully that will work for us a four day working week we're about halfway through the trial at the moment it's really exciting it's going really well and it really helps support work-life balance which is really important to me and my colleagues and that's my five top tim tips Dan. <laughs> fantastic thank you and there's some really great points there Natalie yeah. and um, I think a lot of people on today's call and people that watch it in the future will be resonating with, with some of those points of how important they are not just for your business but also how you feel yourself within the workplace. I'm very intrigued about the four-day working week and there's lots of discussion as you like to say about that at the moment and you know, being in the being in a trial, I guess, will will give you lots of learnings as you come out of it, and I think that'll be something that um, I, I would certainly like to hear more about, probably at another time. But I, I appreciate you taking the time to give us your top, top five today. So thank you ever so much. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, so a really good session to to kick us off with. Then um, some some really important points there. Um, as I said, we're going to head over to Charlotte now, and. Um, I'm going to ask you, Charlotte, to introduce your top five and um, yeah, share with us what your, your nuggets of um, yeah, retention strategies might look like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. So, yeah, a couple of mine are very similar to Natalie, actually, but in a slightly different way, because obviously I work within the estate agency and lettings industry. And quite often there are small agencies, there are larger agencies, so no two estate and letting agencies are often the same. So somebody's career path in a smaller business might be different from somebody's career path in a larger business. So I think my first tip is that whatever size of your business, you need to make sure that everybody's role is very clearly defined and structured. I think people, when they're uncertain of their responsibilities, they're uncertain of the processes, they don't know really what their responsibilities are, that can cause people to leave. Because if you don't know what you're measured on and you don't know what you're achieving, then you feel like you might leave. I left a job once, it was in radio, funnily enough, um, because I didn't feel like I was any good and I didn't think I was good enough. And I fast forward a few years, I bumped into my boss and my boss said, we were gutted when you left, you were so good. Well, I didn't realize I was any good. So there are two parts here. If your role is defined and you know what you're being measured by, whether that's targets, whether that's, um, you know, output or, um, you know, sales agreed or just tasks in a day, whatever it is, you need to understand your role. And the second one of my tips relates to that because you need that positive feedback based on whatever your role is. Now, quite often you see property managers and their role can be very stressful, very difficult. They're dealing with difficult tenants. They might have laws and compliance and rent together. That's much harder to measure somebody's output than perhaps the lister because they've put 20 properties on the market this week and, and nearly the negotiators sold 10. So I think, again, you know, in a difficult job role, whether you're in admin or property management or you're the manager, understanding what your role is and then having that positive feedback. And very much like Natalie said, that kind of feedback doesn't have to be you've got a pay rise. It's not always money. Quite often it's, um, we used to let our team go home early on a Friday if they've hit their target, or we'd have um, pizza Fridays. An agency I work with now, she goes off and buys McFlurries and brings McFlurry ice creams in on a Friday because that's just part of making everyone feel valued. But I think very specific individual feedback is very important. And for me, feedback has to be on a one to one basis because group feedback, if you're not the most confident member of your team, you will feel like I did, that it didn't apply to me. So I think that one to one feedback is hugely important. The other thing I think about our industry in terms of retention and tip three is about 
knowing what your opportunity for progression is. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, not every business in a state agency is the same. And a good, good business owner will recognize your team's uh, desires. Now, not everybody wants to be the CEO. Some people just want to be really, really good at their job role. And they may just want to be measured and rewarded for being excellent in their job role. So having a structure that is an individual for every member of staff is key. So obviously I run Able Agent and we do training and qualifications. So quite often we do training um, with groups of people and we normally see a third of people are really motivated by a qualification. They are desperate to be trained. They are pushing forward and they fly. A third kind of get there, you know, they're really keen, but they're busy and they need a bit more support. And a third aren't motivated by that. They, they, they just want to turn up and get on with their job. So setting a measurable training and development plan so that you can keep everybody on track because the measurement and training plan for your really keen trainer or training um, uh, staff member compared to somebody who's not as mo motivated, they need to be different. You need to adapt them to the individual. Think about whether you build qualifications in, whether you build a technical pathway, whether the rewards are certification or badges or, you know, pizzas on a Friday, whatever it may be, that ability to be measured as excellent and having a career progression opportunity. Um, with qualifications, it's really important that you that the team member understands why we're, we're training and getting qualifications. Some people might feel it's because I'm not good enough, therefore they need to train me. Other people may feel, what an opportunity, I'm so lucky to be chosen for this qualification. So understanding your staff member's mentality and the way they approach something and how they measure it is very, very important. So this then goes on to tip four. Do you really understand your team members' goals? You know, how are you supporting them? Because my goal in my 20s was to take over the world and buy Mulberry handbags. You know, those two things were equally important at that time. So how do we understand everybody's goal? Somebody else might be really happy turning up and being recognised as absolutely excellent at their job role. So one-to-ones kind of sit in here. And if there's a business you're not running regular one-to-one -one meetings with your teams, then, then you're missing a trick because they're such a fantastic opportunity, A, as a business owner to get what you want out of the meeting, but B, for that staff member to feel that they are absolutely um, involved in the business. Going back to what Natalie said, do you feel part of the business? Do I understand where I sit um, in the role? And then flexibility. I think, you know, my, my, my life has always been a bit mixed. You know, at one point I was married and had a full time job. The next minute I was divorced and a single mum. So my needs as, a, as an employee changed. So the ability to work flexibly in my career became hugely important. And I think recognizing people's skills, my every single one of my employers has recognized my passion to train and they let me do that. And that allowed me to set myself up as a, as a trainer as I progressed over time. So that ability for your employer to say, look, you're really good at this. This is your opportunity. I think is very powerful, whether that's the compliance expert or the customer service expert or the sales expert, whatever it is. But that flexibility in your career and the ability to work from home, I think the pandemic's been absolutely phenomenal to highlight that your team want to have a flexible work-life balance. Now that doesn't mean that everybody works from home because they absolutely don't. Um, but some people may need that flexibility. And I know personally that I can, you know, be doing a really important sales call, then I'll be doing some training, then I'll put a wash on. And for me, that is perfection because I am the queen of multitasking. So I think understanding your individual's situation and their, des you know, desire to, to achieve flexibility, and I think this all ties into well-being. And I think most businesses nowadays are taking responsibility for their team's well-being, not just in a, in a tick box way, but in a really genuine one-to-one um, -one support. And on Able Agent during the pandemic, we produced a well-being course because we recognised how important understanding that you can take time out is um, because that's part of um, the success in a business is that team feel valued and they are able to take a step back if they need to. So that's my that's my top five tips. I think there's some fantastic points there. And, and you know, like you said, there's some similarities actually with what, what Natalie picked up in terms of her. I think we'll start to see that theme through probably most of our panellists today. 
Um, just want to cover, cover on one point with you, and that is looking at the positive feedback, the regular reviews. Um, a lot, I think a lot of businesses I've worked for before have underestimated the importance of that part of, I guess, connecting with people, making people feel valued and be part of a business. I think, you know, it is such an important part to get right as a line manager or a business leader if, if your businesses aren't doing that. It probably is one of the, the basics of management, but actually one of the most important parts of management too. And I, I think I hope you agree with that too. Um, but I think it's a really good, good point, Charlotte, and, and thank you ever so much for, uh, for sharing your top five with us. Um, I'm going to move on now to Glynis. And um, Glynis, you, you've worked in HR. Um, you've also been a business leader. I'm interested to see what your points would be. So I'm going to hand over to you to uh, share your top five with us now, if that's OK. Well, thanks very much. Um, there's so many different things, but I'd actually like to start with um, creating and maintaining an open door culture mm. and an open door policy. And to me, that doesn't matter whether you're a small organization or a big organization. If you have an open door policy where people feel that they can come in and talk to you about what's going on in the business, you as a business leader do actually know what's going on in the business. It helps, you know, certainly with that. But you create a really strong team culture. You can't help but create that. And individuals want to be valued for their input as well as their output. So they want to see, well, what is the vision? What are we going for? What, what is that team doing? And so you creating a culture with an open door policy, you know, really, really helps with that. I don't know if anybody's read, and I'm sure a few have, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Now, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs was written, I don't know how long ago, but it is as valid today as it was then. So people, if you're part of a, you know, a small firm, that's great, you know, because people can have, want to feel belonging, want to feel part of the team. If you're part of a bigger organisation, they want to be part of that bigger team as well. So, you know, it's about sharing ideas, making sure that, you know, that open door culture is available throughout you know, throughout the organisation. Um, and what that allows you to do as a, as a leader or a business owner or, you know, a team leader of a team, if we think about the best people that we've ever worked for, those people will always be the ones that made us do something that we thought oh, I'm not quite sure I can do that. It sort of took us a bit out of our comfort zone. And if you have an open door culture, you as the leader will get to know your people really well and you'll be able to play to their strengths and they will be able to achieve things that they never thought possible. Um, and so for me, creating and maintaining an open door policy is so important you know, to a business, no matter how large or how small that business is. So that's my first top tip. My second one is about training, and I would be flabbergasted if everybody on here didn't talk about training, because I think these days, especially, I was very fortunate when I first started working, because that wasn't the norm, but I was really fortunate because the business I first started working with, they did provide training. Um, and I think today people expect it. Uh, and I think they should get it as well. Um, and if it's a question of cost, there's various things that you can do in house. But there are some phenomenal, um, you know, training companies out there, um, some of which, of course, are, are here today. Uh, so I think people expect it and I think they should get it. I also think that these days they expect to get not just training, which helps them with the job that they're doing, but skills training that they can use outside of a work environment. And by that, I mean things like, you know, behavioral styles. You know, you can, you can learn that and apply that at work, but you can also learn that and apply that at home. In fact, sometimes you can go on one of those training courses and think, no wonder my husband and I argue so much on a Friday. Um, so I think people expect that and I, and I think they should get it. And it, it's a really important part of, of the whole work experience. My third top tip, and I know that, you know, one or two have mentioned it already, is 
not everybody can be promoted, but everybody can be developed. And I think that we shouldn't make it too complicated. It doesn't matter whether you're a CEO or you're an apprentice. Everybody wants the answer to three questions. What's expected of me? How am I doing? And what can I do to improve? It's dead simple. Everybody wants the answer to those questions because nobody that I know ever gets up and thinks, how bad a job can I do today? They just don't. They get up and they, you know, how much can I contribute? What's, you know, what's the day going to hold? What, you know, how do I feel about it? And I think those three questions are, you know, are really important. You know, what's expected? How am I doing? What can I do to improve? And then, you know, just as the others were saying about sort of measuring people against those goals. I think one of the best books I've ever read, and it's a really thin book and it's brilliant, and I still keep reading it now, 30 years on, is The One Minute Manager. Because that shows you in such a simple way how different people are at different stages. Um, and that, you know, helps with all the other two top tips that we've gone through um, up to now. And the fourth tip is about, and I, you know, I think Charlotte's mentioned it as well, about making sure that you've got specific job descriptions because there is nothing more irritating than if you, as a boss or your boss, gives you a job and then gives it to somebody else as well. You think, well, I've just spent half an hour doing that or two hours doing that. You know, that's why to have a specific job description so people know exactly what it is that they have to do, um, then they will be committed and accountable and, and want to achieve that. And once I went on this, um, I went on this management skills day and it was full of very notable speakers and they were very, very good. But the one speaker that always, you know, I, I always remember was somebody that said, recruit good people and then don't hack them off. Except he didn't use the word hack and I wouldn't possibly substitute it with anything else here. But I remember that to this day because if you've got good people and you've got a good job description and, and all that kind of thing, you can then give them the platform for them to excel in whatever it is, you know, that they're doing. And I know that, you know, we've, there's been speakers before you know, talking about, you know, strengths and development areas and everything. So being really clear on what you want them to do and then letting them do it, I think, is, you know, is a really important tip. And the last but not least tip is have fun together as a team, because a team that plays together stays together. And there's lots of ways that you can do that from going down to the pub to have a quiz to, you know, lots of different ways. But I think that's, you know, that's important that as a team, you really have fun together. So those would be my five top tips. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think they're, they're really important points. Glynis, thank you ever so much for, uh, for taking your time to, to pull those together. And it's, it's interesting, actually, and I'm sure Claire will pick this up towards the end, is the theme that's running through. Obviously, retention is the overall strategy, but there are some real great themes coming through here, which, um, which we're able to share with everybody listening in to this particular uh, TMTV series. And I think the book, The One Minute Manager, just to come back on that, Glynis, I've still got a copy in my drawer. Uh, mm -hmm comes out quite regularly, um, as does The Speed of Trust by Stephen Covey, which of course is another yes. one building foundations of trust within an organisation, which comes back to your open door policy and actually just having, you know, making people feel, you know, they can come and talk to you, whatever. I think that's really important. Um, so thank you ever so much. Um, we are going to move over now to uh, Rebecca and uh, cover your top five, Rebecca. So I'm going to hand over to you if that's okay. Thanks, Dan. Yes, and thanks, Glynis. You're um, taking me back to my A-level psychology days with your um, Maslow theory reminder, so thank you for that. Um, so I, I've 
probably got similar themes to a lot of what's been said today, but my background in a law firm possibly gives uh, another dynamic to the conversation. Um, and I think the first thing to say is that with staff retention, there really is no, no quick fix and um, no magic wand. And I think it's been a, you know, I, I think everyone would agree it's been a really turbulent couple of years in the property industry, probably in my 20 odd years or so, the, the worst I've seen in terms of, you know, real challenges in, in, in the working day. And so I think it has led to quite a lot of people evaluating their position and looking at kind of change and whether that um, turbulence means that they should move on. So um, it's definitely a real challenge for us. But I guess the perspective that I'm coming at um, from this in a, from the point of retention is to look at um, what is truly important to us as individuals and what kind of makes us stay loyal and connected to a particular organisation. So, so my top tips, um, as I say, similar to what's been said today, but my first one is around really understanding employees as individuals and building a personal connection with them. I think, you know, it, it, what, what we all want for our careers and where we want to work is a really individ, individualistic thing. Um, I think you know, what we've said about things like well-being and focusing on things like physical and mental health and understanding what's important to each of our people that work with us is, is really, really important. Um, I think it's, as a, as a business leader, you know, the, the top tip here is just being really generous with your time and trying to understand individuals and connect with them individual, individually. You know, that can be tricky when, 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 you know, you're leading a team and the day job gets in the way and there's so much to do, but, there is a lot of value that employees find in that connection and in that understanding. And there's a huge amount to be gained for you as an, as an organisation as well, once you, once you do understand, that need, understand those needs. I think it's about kind of almost looking at what's the experience of our most junior people in those situations and, and really understanding what it's like um, to, work, you know, to work within your organisation, not just, you know, kind of when you're dealing with, yourselves and your immediate maybe um, leadership team or managers, but also the, the experience of the junior people, because then you can really sort of uh, really, really connect with what's going on on the ground. So my second top tip um, is, is really also about ensuring that your organisation is really reflecting the changing demographic, the changing landscape and the current trends. So we've already talked about kind of flexibility and people wanting more agile working and working from home, you know, what, what is the current push? There's definitely a real push on that flexibility and, um, you know, that, that working from home balance. But also from a point of view of, of, of as I say, that demographic and the diversity um, is really interesting. I was interviewing um, somebody uh, a couple of weeks ago who was looking to join us. And for the first time, I was really pushed on you know, what are your policies on diversity? Where is there, you know, give me examples of people in your organization that, that you know, I, I can aspire to. You know, give me some examples of, you know, they, they use the same kind of, be, can I be what I can see? Talk to me about how, how diverse your organization is and what your policy is and how you're really living and breathing that. And I found that really interesting interview that that was really, really important to a candidate. So I think, you know, there's definitely, something in there around um, making sure that your organisation is really reflecting that. Um, my third one is around, um, and this has been talked about, tailored career progression planning. But I, I guess I would add to that just really genuinely and authentically um, career planning with individuals. It really does need a, a huge investment. Um, there's a there's a lot of people that are told again at interview. Yes, we've got the you know we've got progression. Yeah, you know, there are opportunities here to develop if you want to if you want to aspire to to progress further. And I think particularly in the legal industry, that can be quite challenging because of the way that there are different uses for different roles. So we've got kind of legal assistants and then paralegals and then trainees and then legal execs and we've got associates and senior associates, legal directors. And different law firms use these different role 
uh, roll, I guess, names in different ways. And so it's not always apples for apples. So you've got to really make sure that your uh, teams really understand what that tailored career progression looks like and how they attain the different um, next stages. And certainly one of the things that I do when I'm mentoring, and even if it's someone not in, in my team where I'm a mentor, is to look at what, what the career framework is within our organization and then look at the competencies and to say okay you really need to push this and push your push your um team leader to say look here are the competencies where do I meet them where are my gaps what's my next stage how can I expect the next timeline um and I think it's just really converting career progression and planning into really genuine and authentic planning so that there's a yeah that's really transparent and I think we've talked about, you know, think different types of training, but one of the other things that I see with career planning is, and particularly in, within the law, is, is people asking for uh, additional business skills. So we, we've developed a really fantastic business skills academy because when, when you go into the law, you're trained in the law itself. And so you have all this academic training um, but not necessarily any of the business skills, which is, you know, what the modern day lawyer really needs to have. And so, you know, kind of the technology skills, the commercial skills, client development, um, how you sell yourself, how you become a, an advisor rather than just a lawyer, how you solve problems. So um, often that career planning isn't just around, you know, how I become you know, the best lawyer or the best rocket scientist in one particular area of the law it's around how can I go and get myself a bunch of other business skills that I haven't necessarily picked up through my university or my LPC or my Silex and all of that kind of stuff so so that that's definitely really important top tip number four is around transparency around kind of the vision the strategy of the firm and the performance of the firm in what I try to do with my team is be really transparent about what our goals are, what the targets are, kind of how we're performing against that on a regular basis. And that's really about connecting everyone to what's going on in the organisation. And um, I think as individuals, we all really thrive when we have a purpose. And if they understand the purpose and the transparency of what's going on in an organisation, people feel like, they can make a difference and I think that garners a huge amount of loyalty and a, and a classic example of that was during the pandemic when we like many organizations needed to to think about what was going to be the economic output as a result of the the pandemic and concerns over the financial performance so we like many other firms um deployed a, a temporary reduce to salaries and um as a result of some caution over what might have gone on um, and to kind of protect the business and protect roles. And in doing so, we were very transparent about why we were doing that, what the figures looked like and, um, and, and really got the kind of buy-in. And that really worked because it was, there was reason for it. There was understanding of what that strategy was. And similarly, when actually the position turned out to be a lot better than we expected and we performed financially better than we expected, we shared that success too. We showed them that it actually, look at the figures, it's, it's a lot better than we expected and we had, um, we'd, we'd repaid the 10% the, the, um, the that we had taken and, and also given people bonuses. And the point of all of that was that we, we didn't lose people over that decision as difficult as it was because people felt, as though they were connected to what was going on and there was a there was a real vision and purpose for it and we were able to be kind of open and transparent and then my fifth top tip is around kind of it, it's it's all on the theme of I suppose talent management and talent role models I think people often choose to stay within an organization not necessarily because they're just uh, worried about financial remuneration and that type of reward but because that they see role models that they aspire to or want to follow and I think if you have a real focus on developing talent within your organization at all levels that can really really influence and keep people connected and engaged I've certainly stayed within a role myself personally because of 
people that I'm working with and the talent that I'm following in because I'm gaining and developing personally, um, even when there could have been something more lucrative available there. So if you develop talent at all levels, then that kind of filters down um, and, and, and others can benefit from that and influence others. So I think finally, just to summarise, it's about kind of being connected, um, people feeling connected and valued, understanding their organisation and their personal career pathway. And I think that's much more likely for us to feel a sense of, of loyalty and progress, which ultimately makes us sort of committed to staying on a, a journey with the firm that you're in and, and that you're doing that together. That's me. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And, and some really valid points that hit home, I think, when you when you listen to some of the things and initiatives that you've done and certainly some of the other businesses that, that have carried out. That transparency, I think, is really important around communication, isn't it? And the tactics that, that we deployed across TM Group, actually, as part of that pandemic and, you know, being open, involving people in decisions. And I think that that's such an important part as you develop a changing culture that's needed as you sort of navigate out of pandemic. So, um, yeah, some, some fantastic stuff. And, and thank you for sharing that with us today. Um, and it's really nice to have that viewpoint, actually, where you come from the background that you do with Fatansti and and share some different insights to how things look. I, I think all of our panellists today have all had something different to offer. And I think for the people listening on this call and, and future people listening to this particular TV series, you know, I think there's some brilliant stuff there to take away. So thank you to yourself. Um, thank you for all of our panellists today. Um, there are certainly some great strategies there for retaining staff within property roles and wider fields. Um, Claire, I'm going to come over to you. You've got the difficult job now of um, putting all that together. Um, and there's some brilliant nuggets there for our audience, isn't there, to take away. But perhaps, I don't know, perhaps you can summarise for us today <laughs> my top five of what you said and uh, maybe some of the thoughts that you might have. So I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, just as you said, some fantastic insights there and uh, some brilliant ideas. So thanks, everyone, for, for your contributions. It's a bit of a tough job now to bring it down to five. Um, just picking up on something that was said that there's no magic wand. But I think the fact we're talking about it is that step forward. And I'd encourage any business that if you don't have people at the top of your agenda for any board meeting or SLT meeting, you're missing a trick. Just get it to the top of that agenda, get talked about it in meetings. Um, and I think that's a real step forward because there isn't a magic wand, there isn't a quick fix. But why are we on this call? And it's because retention of staff is so important. It's the right thing to do look after your people, they'll look after your business for you. It's the Richard Branson model. Um, but ultimately, if you don't look after your people and you don't have retention strategies on the agenda, it's gonna be really costly to you as a business. There's tons of research out there that it takes around nine months for somebody to get up to speed. And as an ex-lawyer, I remember the cost of, you know, not having somebody fee earning for nine months is a huge cost to the business. So I'd, I'd, I'd say it's really important to get it on the agenda and talk about retention because it's the right thing to do, to look after your people. But the cost of not doing it, the cost to your teams who have to train somebody new up, the cost of people having to cover for the work while there's somebody missing in that role, um, building relationships internally, building relationships with clients. So I think there's a big cost to not looking at this. I'm delighted we're on this um, series today. So Dan, thanks again for bringing it to the top of the agenda. But yeah, top five. So I've made tons of notes and uh, lots of themes. But um, I think one of the things that really stood out for me is rewarding the hard work and sharing the successes, which Nat Natalie shared with us. And I think it's really important. It doesn't matter what size your business is. It, you can do this on a relatively small budget or a large budget, but taking the time to recognise great work that I think in the current climate, just saying thank you goes such a long, long way and making staff feel that they're part, they're part of that business and they're part of delivering the goals for you. Um, so how can you do this? And it's something I've picked up from the themes today. It could be a simple email thanking somebody. Um, it could be a thank you card a handwritten card, and I know we've talked about office environment today, how can you appeal to people working from home and remote workers? Send them a handwritten card through the post. 
just a thank you or a postcard. Um, there's lots of businesses that have popped up during the pandemic, which make it really easy for you to reward and recognise people, particularly when you're working remotely. We use a brilliant local business called Colleague Box who flipped their business on its head because of lockdown. And now we send out new starter packs through the post with some chocolate and some goodies in there, right through to, instead of normally we would have bought everybody an Easter egg, we sent everyone a little chocolate treat through the post. So there's things you can do to adapt, but I think the rewarding, the hard work and sharing in the success of the business across the entire business is a really, really great tip. And I love that one. And I don't think it matters how small or large business is, you can do this in a really simple, easy way. Um, one that Glynis talks about, which really resonated with me, is that not everyone can be promoted, but everyone can be developed. Mm -hmm. And that for me was really, really kind of touched, touched a uh, um, kind of to my heart, really. And I think having that clarity over what you want from people, finding out what they want, do they want to be developed? Um, we've got such multi generational workforces now, and um, just let's help people be the best they can be. It's no secret that certain generational uh, generations don't want to stay in a business for 10, 15, 20 years. They might be happy to career hop every two years. And, you know, I remember years ago as a lawyer, if you saw someone had jumped around three or four roles in 10 years, that'd be a red flag. Whereas now people are really keen to go and work for businesses where they can thrive. So I think if someone's only going to stay with you for two years, help them grow into the next role. You know, help them, whatever that might be. They might not want to be promoted, but help them be developed. Um, with or without you, that's not only a bad thing, because if they're going to go and leave you, but be a fantastic ambassador for your company, even though they've left, uh, how cool is that? So, yeah, Glynis, thanks. That really, really uh, resonated with me, that. Um, and then, in, again, this is kind of a combined theme that's come through from everybody, but I think Charlotte and Glynis, you both mentioned this. Ensure roles are clearly defined and structured. I wrote down here, clarity, clarity, clarity. Um, when did you last look at your own job description and does it actually marry up to the role you're doing every day? Um, I think be absolutely clear with people what's expected of them. And what does good look like? What is that? What's a brilliant you know, delivery look like? And then let people fly give them the chance, don't hack them off, uh, give them the chance to come in and do the job you wanted them to do, but also creating, and this is linking in definitely to Glynis's point around the safe culture, the open door culture. Um, I've shared this story with many people on my second day at Money, Pay, Money Penny, I made a massive mistake, a huge, huge mistake that they went out of their way to make sure I knew that that was okay. I did a big mistake. I dropped the ball. Day two, you can imagine I was already thinking, oh, my God. And the environment was created that it was OK. It didn't matter. It was OK. It was all right. And it was just, you know, I was reassured it was OK to make a mistake. And that is so, so important. So, yeah, love that and making sure everyone's role is clearly defined and structured. And I would definitely, definitely ask everyone on this call, go and look at your own JDs. Is that the job I either you were brought in to do? Or the one you're actually delivering. Um, again, another top tip, brilliant one here. And it was a tough one. This uh, Rebecca, you talked about the transparency piece, and I was like nodding away when you talk about transparency and transparency. And you know, ensure everyone knows your mission and your vision. You know, and have you got a mission and vision? And do people know the behaviours it takes to help you fulfil that vision? And there's a very, uh, an old, uh, I don't know if it's folklore or not about, allegedly when JFK visited the NASA headquarters back in the 60s, I think, and it was like, he's there chatting to the cleaner saying, what do you do? And the cleaner says, oh, I help put a man on the moon. It's, a, it's an old story. It's a brilliant story. But we've undergone a huge piece of work here at MAB, looking at what's our mission and vision what are we here to do and how can we make sure every single person from the graphic designer to the finance controller knows the role they have to play to help us achieve our vision? Then there's, there's no kind of uh, blurred line. So love that about the, the transparency um, and around the vision. Something that really resonated with me again. And that transparency buys loyalty. Rebecca, you're absolutely right. 
being open and sharing the highs and lows. Gosh, the property world, we're, we're constantly like worrying, aren't we? And who knows what the next few quarters are going to bring in terms of the market slowing down. So share that with people. And I think we worry perhaps sometimes about how do we do this? We're so used to teams now. We have a 10 minute all hands call for anyone across the business every other Friday at three o'clock. It's 10 minutes. It's led by different members of the leadership team and it's anyone can join. It's a quick business update. It's welcoming new starters. You can dial in. It's 15 minutes max and it just keeps in touch. And I think that's what we've learned through kind of being able to use technology that you can keep in touch with people more and communicate. Um, and then <laughs> it was hard to stick to five, Dan, but I have stuck to five. And my final one, um, talented role models. Oh my God, when he said, we've all remembered somebody you've worked with, kind of like when Rebecca said about the talented role models, um, those people, you know, we talk about people leave managers, not businesses. Have a think about anybody on the call listening, who are your cultural brand ambassadors within your business? Who are your influencers? And who are your bad apples? Because you can bet your bad apples are going to influence your retention of staff. So just have conversations with people that either they want to get on the bus and they want to be part of your future, or if it's not for them anymore, that's okay. Help them find the next role outside of your business. But the talented role models for me was key. Who have you already got in your business that gets what you're trying to achieve? But the biggest takeaway from that element of that, that top tip for me was look at the top. Good behaviors have to start from the top and you have to lead by example. Um, but yeah, there was tons more I could have talked about there. Uh, loved the ones about the specific job descriptions. I would question having a think about um, having thinking about on your J, on your job adverts, maybe saying who the role wouldn't suit. So if your job requires somebody to be flexible, be able to um, work in a really agile environment, be able to move to you know different demands and different moving goalposts. This is not going to suit someone who is really, really rigid and strict and needs to work within divine boundaries. So I think about me, you know, having a look at your actual job, job ads. Um, but yes, so conscious of straight, I think, into six there. Sorry, Dan. But uh, great ideas. And I think going back to where I started, getting it on the agenda, talking about it at senior leadership meetings really will help with the retention in the property sector and uh, yeah would love to hear from anybody if they've got ideas or anything they put into place after this session and um, thanks everyone for your contributions those are my top five well thank you claire i think you've summarized them lovely actually i think there's been uh, there's been so much talked about today and, and so much that actually can be positively implemented uh, whatever size of business and i think that's the important thing the breadth of experience that we've got here you know showcases there's different strategies for different things so um thank you and i hope we've given um everybody listening food for thought you know as, as listeners of tmtv we, we try and make sure there are things here that are generated from thought leadership or experience that actually can be shared uh, amongst you and i think what we'd like to do now is um, just do a very short poll with those that are online currently and um, I think at some point very shortly we'll be asked to take part in that so um, if you could do that when the screen prompts you that would be great um, there's going to be a very short pause in the session just while we do that and give you the opportunity just to press a couple of buttons or one particular button that should be in front of your screen now um, the question itself uh, is what do you think is most important for staff retention and this is just you know your your own view as, uh, as our viewers today clearly if you're not part of the live session, this won't be available for you when you're, you're watching this, uh, whether it's on one of our YouTube channels or uh, on one of our social media. But um, we will try and share the results with everybody as well. So I'll just give you a, a bit of 20 odd seconds to pick what you think. I think for the panellists, um, it's a difficult choice that, isn't it, in terms of uh, working out which one is the most important, and clearly they all have an importance. Um, so um, yes, thank you for everybody being so speedy on your uh, keyboards and mice at home. I think um, 
you know, I, I'm positive that we'll see some very interesting results come back, depending on where you're at with your own organisation itself. Um, and on your screen now, you should be able to see um, what is the most important that's come back from that poll. So the standout at the top um, with 50% of our um, listeners today uh, is reward hard work and share the success. Um, followed closely by transparency um, around the vision strategy and performance stroke organisation of the team. Um, and then at the other three, which are talented role models, uh, ensure everyone's role is clearly defined and structured, um, come in at joint third, followed by be specific in your job descriptions, point four. But um, yeah, some fantastic thing. And this is the, the nice thing about doing a poll, you know, in terms of what are those listeners going to be taking away and what are you taking away and uh, that gives us a great indication of some of the uh, some of the things you will do um so as we close i'd like to say a huge thank you <coughs> to natalie uh, charlotte glynis rebecca and claire for joining us today uh, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you on this particular uh, session um i think rebecca there's um, a special day for you i think on friday little birdie tells me so um, i'm going to wish you a very happy birthday for friday <laughs> Who's done that? <laughs> I congratulate you on your new role as partner. I think that's a fantastic. Thank you. And um, yeah, best of luck in the in the future with uh, with that particular role. Um, and, and thank you to everybody at home. You know, participating or home or work uh, in the office, uh, participating and watching for us today. I think um, you know we really enjoy putting these sessions on with you. And um, yes, we've we've got another session coming up. But I think. On your screens in front of you now it would be great if you've got yourself or colleagues that could come and join us that would be brilliant the next session here on TMTV uh, is where we'll be discussing the top five initiatives to boost collaboration across the property transaction a really important point uh, and a really important topic uh, and that'll be on Tuesday the 24th of May uh, again over lunchtime between 12 and 1 um, so if you or anybody in your business would like to um, participate in that or uh, join us that would be great and we ask for those of you who are listening uh, or those that are following um, please do share your thoughts on social media about today and any other session uh, and feel free to share and invite uh, colleagues to these thought leadership sessions in the future but um, from me um, thank you uh, and take good care of yourselves and um, wish you all the best Goodbye. thank you very much <laughs>